Ancient Egypt has always fascinated us, but beyond legendary wonders such as the Great Pyramid of Giza, Egypt is a repository of many lesser-known treasures. Recent discoveries made by scientists were just as astonishing. There were mummified crocodiles, the Temple of Zeus, Tutankhamun's dagger, and golden mummies. And think of the artifacts preserved in the deep sands. You're on Channel Top Facts. Join the viewing and we'll show you 15 of the most famous places in Egypt with its ancient secrets. We wish you an interesting viewing and of course, let's go to the excavations. An artwork discovered in the palace of the ancient Egyptian metropolis of Armana captivated scientists. It's not just a beautiful painting made 3,000 years ago, but a spectacle in itself. Many beautiful birds fly and sit in one space. Experts try to determine the species of these birds and found on the painting blue pigeons, colorful kingfishers, red-backed and white wagtails. They compared these images with materials from ornithological studies. But what significance do these birds have? Could they have symbolic meaning? Or was it just a royal conservatory, a green room that greeted you with the atmosphere of a paradise garden? Bird songs, plants, and water lilies, aromas chirping, and perhaps music? History shows us that this magnificent example of ancient paintings belonged to the period of Pharaoh Akhenaten, also known as Amenhotep IV. During his reign, the religion of Egypt was oriented towards sun worship. The palace, where this masterpiece was found, was built as part of his new capital, Akhetaten. It's a pity that the original of this artwork no longer exists, as historical finds are so fragile and vulnerable. Time turns them into dust. This is a replica, painted over a century ago by Egyptologist artist Nina Degaris Davies. Unfortunately, the conservation technique had the opposite effect. The original darkened, but fortunately, replicas allow us to enjoy ancient art. By the way, Egyptian artists not only had artistic talent, but also the ability to perform very high-quality work. However, they slightly altered the real appearance of some birds. The painting depicts blue pigeons, which did not inhabit the Egyptian marshes, and they added markings to the tails of the wagtails. But no matter, the artist is free to fantasize, and the canvas amazes us with its colorful and magnificence even if we have not deciphered its meaning. In the palace of the same ancient Akhetaten, in a secret burial around 3,300 years old, delicious golden ornaments were found. Once a thriving city built by Pharaoh Amenhotep IV in the northern region of Egypt, it was an experiment in restructuring political and religious beliefs in an innovative system. That's why the pharaoh moved the capital from Thebes and grew a new city in the desert. Ironically, all his reforms worshipping the solar disk were undone by none other than his son, the legendary Tutankhamun. Now, we can see the same wealth that the pharaohs possessed. Among the bright golden ornaments, there is a ring with a relief carving. Representing the god of joy called Bess. Symbolic, isn't it? This god was not only the soul of the party, but also sponsored childbirth and had a kind and playful nature. It is interesting to wonder who wore this ring, the pharaoh himself or his close associates. Also in the collection was a necklace of impressive beauty and other precious objects. Apparently, the most reliable way to preserve them was to bury them. When we look at the pyramids of ancient Egypt, we are always amazed by their greatness and also wonder how it was possible to build all this without modern technology, only with physical strength. Is it possible to erect such structures only with the power of slave labor? A group of talented archaeologists from the University of Liverpool and the French University of Oriental Archaeology in Cairo 
pondered this question for a long time. They studied pyramid construction technologies. What they discovered was simply amazing. A 4,500-year-old system was cradle-like. And are you saying that in this way all the seven known wonders of the world were built? How could these huge blocks be systematically transported back and forth, taking into account the human factor, such as organizing the work of thousands of people in a single team? However, the masterpiece of ancient engineering is here before our eyes, and it had its architects and foremen. Perhaps it reminds you of the work of an ant colony, but most likely at that time, it simply could not have been done any other way. In the Fayum Oasis, approximately 60 miles south of Cairo, archaeologists excavated an unusual burial site. They found the bones of an eight-year-old child among the remains of 142 dogs. A horrifying scenario investigated by Egyptianologists from the Russian Academy of Sciences Center played out around the first century BCE, and this burial was unlike any other. The child's body lay on the dogs, most of which were small puppies. And there was another strange surprise. A linen bag was placed over the child's head. What could have been the purpose of this event? Could it have been some ritual, blending religions and magical ideas, perhaps brought by foreigners living in the region? The presence of blue clay on the dog remains, abundant in Egyptian water bodies, led scientists to believe that all this could have been a drama of a catastrophic flood. The absence of signs of violence suggests that drowning could have been the cause of death. But what was the child doing at the dog kennel? Perhaps he was taking care of the dogs. There was another strange similar case. In the necropolis, a similarly bag covered body was discovered, but with an arrow in the chest indicating execution. Could these two sad incidents be connected? This unique treasure was unearthed. A magnificent dagger saw the light of day, having lain in the tomb of its owner, the Pharaoh Tutankhamun, for thousands of years. But what astonished scientists was its clearly extraterrestrial origin. How, you ask, did it come from space? And you would be 90% correct. Archaeologists were puzzled by the material itself. It turns out that the dagger, owned by the famous pharaoh of ancient Egypt, was made from iron produced in space, forged from a piece of iron meteorite, an unknown metal to Earth with a triangular pattern, later named Gibeon. During the reign of Tutankhamun, Iron smelting had not yet been established. This rare and valuable item, according to one theory, was made in Anatolia, now modern Turkey. This was determined by the material of glue on the handle. Green gypsum was widely used in Anatolia at that time, and Turkish craftsmen have long been renowned for their skill in making cold weapons. According to historical sources, Tutankhamun's grandfather received this dagger from the ruler of Mitanni, a region in Anatolia. Another theory suggests that the design of the top of the handle resembles an Aegean artifact, but the typically Egyptian shape of the blade could have been made at home. The iron blade seems to have been forged using a low temperature method. What do you think? Why has this dagger become a subject of controversy? And what does it really resemble? In the long tunnel beneath the Egyptian sands, at the peak of the great Osiris Temple, stretches a one and a half kilometers long path underground. This tunnel is a true architectural wonder. Geometrically, it's identical to the legendary tunnel of Eupolinus in Greece. Archaeologist Kathleen Martinez long puzzled by the search for the tomb of Cleopatra herself, discovered this amazing tunnel at a depth of 13 meters during the excavations at the Temple of Tapasiris Magna, the original name of its language. What is this secret path? Where does it lead? 
and why is it partially flooded? Historians believe that the explanation lies in natural disasters that shook the region. Martinez also discovered two alabaster statues from the Ptolemaic era, ceramic vessels and pots. This sheds some light on ancient Egyptian civilization, but here's the catch. Cleopatra's name is known worldwide, yet her tomb remains undiscovered. Notably, at this location, incredible artifacts were unearthed, including coins bearing the names and portraits of Cleopatra VII, the very one, and Alexander the Great. Could this tunnel lead to the Queen's burial chamber, and perhaps there lies her beloved Mark Antony? As known, their lives ended in suicide. What were the Egyptian traditions in this regard? In the time untouched sands, in a tomb of the ancient necropolis Kubat Aha on the west bank of the Nile, archaeologists discovered something amazing, a cache of mummified crocodiles dating back 2,500 years. Unlike other mummies, these ten crocodiles were not treated with resin and were not eviscerated. They were buried whole. Such an opportunity comes once in a lifetime for archaeologists to study the remains of an entire ancient beast. They were local Nile crocodiles, as well as specimens of the West African crocodile, all huge, ranging from 2 to 3 meters in length. But how did they end up in the tomb? Apparently, they were mummified in sand quarries elsewhere before being brought here around the 5th century BCE. What a journey these reptiles had! Perhaps it was a message. The crocodiles were not killed, but died from asphyxiation due to drowning or prolonged exposure to the scorching Egyptian sun. It's strange to imagine a drowning crocodile, but many of them were bound with rope. This more accurately paints the circumstances of their death. Dehydration might have killed them. For the ancient Egyptians, crocodiles were sacred animals. These fierce creatures were associated with the crocodile-headed great god of water, Sobek, who protected from venomous creatures and was the patron of the Nile. These mummified crocodiles could have been a religious offering to grant fertility to the land. Either way, scientists are now working with them, determining ages using radiocarbon testing and studying DNA. This mysterious lady is indeed an unusual archaeological exhibit. Have you ever seen a mummy in an interesting condition? Imagine the discovery. Inside the womb of this woman, a fetus was preserved. This is the first pregnant mummy that posed many questions to scientists. How did the Egyptians manage to preserve the embryo inside the woman? Studies have shown that it was subjected to a very strong acidic environment of the uterus, causing its bones to dissolve over time. Although the woman was mummified according to all the rules, organs were removed. But this life-saving capsule of the unborn child represents only soft tissues without a soul. In essence, they just remained preserved. Here our consciousness is convulsing, trying to understand what the embryo represents, an unmanifested in the world, and therefore an inanimate creation. And at what moment of existence does a soul appear in a person? Again, organs were removed during mummification. Experts have suggested that it was too difficult to remove the fetus at this stage of development. But if the body has already left life, then what's the difference? Possibly there was some religious significance that we did not know about. We do not even know neither of the name nor the social status of this woman. Only, excuse the pun, that she was in a condition at the time of her death and this undoubtedly paints us a dramatic story. There are only small clues about her life. First, this tomb was secret, where access was ordered. Secondly, along with the woman's body, jewelry in the form of birds and snakes were buried, 
and there was also a tongue made of gold. Could this be the pregnant wife of a pharaoh from whom the appearance of a little god was expected? Or are these just her favorite ornaments, buried next to the body without any symbolic meaning? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Surely this plot provoked some considerations in you. It was a tooth that allowed archaeologists to establish the identity of this mummy, a female pharaoh named Hebshitsut, who ruled more than 3,000 years ago, was one of only two female rulers of Egypt throughout its history. However, her legacy was mysteriously destroyed, and even her mummy disappeared. However, in the tomb discovered by archaeologists, there were two female bodies, but which one was the queen? The clue was in a wooden box. There was a tooth inside. It was this very tooth that helped determine which of the mummies belonged to the female pharaoh. Archaeologists turned to dentists for help in studying tooth x-rays, and miraculously, this tooth perfectly fit into the jaw structure of one of the mummies. Thus, scientists realized that they were looking at Queen Habshitsut, a legendary and successful ruler whose reign strengthened Egypt and allowed the country to prosper. But the surprises don't end there. Computer tomography also revealed details about the health of the mummy. She had diabetes and even liver cancer. However, it seems that poor dentists were her downfall, presumably because they had attached the tooth to the body. Shortly before her death, Local dentists removed a molar tooth, damaging the gum and introducing an infection. Eventually, Habshitsu died of sepsis in her palace in Thebes, lonely, abandoned by everyone, and long months of suffering from pain and fever. To this day, the tomb of this famous beauty and ruler has not been found, and yet, many would like to see what she looked like in life and after death. Hieroglyphs deciphered in the tomb of Tutankhamun revived the belief that Queen Nefertiti was buried next to her stepson somewhere in a secret room. Nicholas Reeves, a renowned British Egyptologist, shed light on this question by studying the burial site of Tutankhamun. He suggested that Nefertiti's tomb is not an independent object but part of a larger structure. Perhaps the tomb of Tutankhamun could lead to the final resting place of the legendary Queen Nefertiti. Otherwise, she couldn't just be buried in some unknown place. And, of course, there must be some secret underground passage leading there. Scientists are helped by everything. Their study of hieroglyphs and mold apply all sorts of technologies. Someday, they will finally unearth the entrance to Nefertiti's tomb, gates to a lost era where queens, pharaohs, and treasures ruled. And this entire magnificent century represented a mix of cruelty and unimaginable splendor. To understand this discovery, we must go back to the 4th century AD where the influence of the Roman Empire on Egypt began to wane. During the excavations of the ancient port of Berenice, archaeologists unearthed a magnificent temple that was 1,700 years old, and it stunned scientists with its strange contents. Hence, it was the name of the Temple of the Falcon. There were 15 skeletons of birds on stone pedestals 13 of which were beheaded. A stone monument 38 centimeters high, various cult objects, and an iron harpoon. On the stone stele with a relief image, there was a mysterious Greek inscription. The beheading of falcons could have been a ritual of sacrifice, but what was the significance of the stone memorial? Moreover, there were fragments of fish skeletons, eggshell, and mammal bones. Who needed to drag all this into a temple? These questions were answered by the deciphered stele. Apparently, it speaks of a ritual motive for beheading birds, 
At the top of the stele, a winged sun and cobras are depicted, and at the bottom, a pharaoh with gifts. The Greek text on the stele warns that boiling a bird's head in this sanctuary is considered an indecent activity. Probably, this was previously done to facilitate plucking feathers. Well, we say, the Egyptians had their important activities. Zeus, the chief god in Greek mythology, the great thunderer, and a magnificent temple was built in Olympia for his worship. How strange it was for scientists to discover the temple of Zeus in Egypt. Archaeologists found the remains of a temple dedicated to Zeus on the Sinai Peninsula. It stood on Mount Cassius. Now it's the border of Syria and Turkey. According to legend, the first act of Zeus's battle with the terrible monster Typhon erupted exactly in this place. Archaeologists discovered two large pink granite columns, which might have been the gates to the temple, and collapsed due to a strong earthquake. Then, granite slabs, remnants of a staircase were found, and these pink stones appeared in many elements of the temple's construction. Mount Cassius historically served as a sacred place for worship in many religions, which gives us the right to judge the multicultural civilizations of ancient times. The question is, how did the ancient Egyptians come to worship the Greek god? What ceremonies and rituals took place inside these secret walls, and what valuable things will be discovered during new excavations, and what, perhaps, brings ancient Greece and Egypt closer together? Before us are charming creatures, mummified lion cubs. The Ministry of Antiquities of Egypt has unveiled a magnificent collection of ancient artifacts and mummified creatures in a necropolis in the Sahara Desert. At the center of the collection of 75 exhibits was something remarkable, at least two mummy lion cubs. Also found were wooden and bronze statues of cats, intricately decorated wooden boxes with mummies of cats and other animals, bulls, mongooses, ibises, and falcons, crocodiles, cobras, and scarab beetles. Interestingly, who needed this mummified menagerie and what was the purpose? To defy earthly creatures or simply bury them with their owner's pets? For the first time, a lion cub mummy was discovered in Egypt and five other cats also turned out to be lion cubs. Their identity was checked by computer tomography. People believed that creating mummies of various creatures was a means of communication with their gods. Doesn't this kind of remind you of some kind of puppet theater? The ritual sacrifice of animals became a widespread practice, meaning that the Egyptians held great respect for cats, dogs, falcons, monkeys, snakes, and crocodiles. Imagine someone had to do all this work. Scientists in Egypt have discovered strange fossils a vertebrae bone of a new species of dinosaur from the Aralosaurus family. This strange flat-faced dinosaur, similar to a bulldog with stocky limbs and small teeth, all this reminds us of the plots of Jurassic Park, doesn't it? In this time, this bipedal dinosaur roamed the Sahara Desert, and this was approximately 98 million years ago in the Cretaceous period. My goodness, you'll say that this was the last era of dinosaurs. And this carnivorous six-meter beast, the size of a good yacht, survived its predecessors. Dinosaurs usually inhabited Europe and the Southern Hemisphere, so the discovery surprised archaeologists. For the first time, dinosaur skeletons were found in Egypt in the Beharia Oasis. Maybe it was a long-lost dino sheep. The University of Paleontology has set itself an ambitious task, an exhibition to extract fossils in the Beharia Oasis, which has become a hotspot for dinosaur discoveries. But unfortunately, most of the remains were destroyed. Think about it. By the Second World War, 
Even this one short-armed and flat-faced skeleton is enough to vividly imagine the Sahara populated by dinosaurs hundreds of millions of years ago. We used to think that mummification was used to preserve the appearance of the deceased person. But thanks to the efforts of the Manchester Museum, the true purpose of Egypt's golden mummies has been revealed. This complex burial technique was merely a method of maintaining a decent appearance of the body in case there was a chance of resurrection. Then the resurrected would not have to be embarrassed about their appearance. In fact, joking aside, bodies were turned into mummies to make them gone to God. Initially, the Egyptians began using salt to preserve fish for the future to eat later. This natural mineral found along the Nile is used in temple rituals and even for cleansing divine statues. For mummification, the Egyptians also used incense, the same that was buried in temples. In their view, applying incense to the body turned it into a deity. The word itself, meaning incense, translates from their language as to make divine. The Egyptians seriously believed in the afterlife, so they took burial ceremonies so responsibly, as if it meant not the end, but a continuation. All these sarcophagi and funeral masks were not meant to hide the identity of the deceased, but rather to idealize them before fulfilling their divine mission. That's all for today, friend. Thank you so much for watching to the very end, and if you liked the episode and want to see something similar or the next part, then like, write comments, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and check out our previous top releases.